So uh, this is uh, some stuff I've been doing with, uh, with Niels Martin Muller. Um, he's right there. So Niels, if I forget to say anything, just uh, don't be afraid to chime in, or anybody else. OK, so uh, let me just go ahead and state the, um, so I should say that rotational here means surfaces of revolution. Uh, you know, not rotational symmetry or anything like that, which, you know. Um, so uh, let's see here. Let me just state, get to the theorem. OK, so um, the theorem that we've sort of got is, um, you know, I, I, we have a, a com any complete embedded self-shrinking hypersurface of revolution is either a flat hyperplane, a round uh, cylinder, radius 2 squared 2n minus 1, round sphere, radius 2n, or an embedded torus. It's sort of, we're sort of in the middle of trying to get the uni uniqueness of, uh, so in uh, his paper, uh, Shrinking Donuts, right, Anganen constructed this uh, self-shrinking torus that Bill mentioned in his talk this morning. And it's, uh, it's got to be the only one there. But we're, we're still sort of thinking about it. So we'd like to be able to replace the, the article N with Anganen's full name there. So we don't quite have it yet. But so in particular, there's no sort of like uh, mean curvature sort of Delaunay sort of analog um, to the constant mean curvature family. OK, so another theorem that we sort of proved sort of along the way was that if you have, so we sort of construct so there's a theorem of, of, uh, of Huiskin, right, that says um, if you have any rotational surface given by a graph over an entire axis, then it has to be the cylinder, right? So um, we sort of looked at half graphs, so sort of rotational things that are asymptotic or that are, that are, you know, not complete surfaces but just have one end. And so we found a whole family of these guys that are asymptotic to cones infinity. So the theorem here is that for each integer greater than two, we have a unique one parameter family of curves. Uh, gamma sub sigma, the sigma is positive, uh, in the upper half plane where, so gamma is a graph over the positive x-axis, so I just mean the right half. Um, it's asymptotic to the ray r equals sigma x, and uh, generates a, a, away from the boundary, a mean curvature flow self shrinker. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, so these guys, so I apologize for my uh, Beamer presentation. Uh, there's not supposed to be anything here, it's just uh, I had trouble with the, with the new frame command. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe somebody can help me after that. Uh, okay, so, um, so uh, that's sort of the, the, uh, the theorem I first showed is sort of the cool way of presenting a theorem as sort of an almost classification theorem. What we actually proved is that uh, if you have any um, complete embedded surface revolution satisfying the self shrinker equation, then it's, if it's not a torus or a plane, then it has positive mean curvature. And then if we can spin, uh, holding in a Cosby theorem to take over and we know what these guys are. Okay. Um, blank page. Uh, okay, so uh, Bill already told us this morning why we study self-shrinkers, basically because they model type 1 singularities, and it's a consequence of Huskin's monotonicity theorem formula. Uh, so there's some, uh, there's very few examples of uh, complete embedded guys. So uh, if it pauses mean curvature, cylinders and spheres. So we have this Anganen torus, which is probably unique, but we don't know yet. Um, and there's, as various people mentioned throughout the day, uh, there's lots of numerical evidence for a whole bunch of others, especially when you allow for higher genus. Um, so, uh, of course, if you have a positive mean curvature sphere, it has to be the round sphere, but if you get outside the class of positive mean curvature things, then you might have some sort of weird self shrinking spheres that are still embedded. I should say that a lot of immersed guys, almost certainly. I don't think anybody actually has a, has a proof of this, but again, there's a lot of numerical examples for, for, uh, for immersed spheres. Um, so what our theorem says is that at least there's no weird guys within the class of rotational spheres, right? Spheres of revolution. Another blank page, a couple of them. So uh, let me just tell you how we sort of, so uh, what this class of, uh, of cone asymptotic uh, uh, solutions is. So um, I'm apparently missing a page here, so, uh, which isn't a catastrophe. So it just means I'll have to write some things, uh, write some things down on a convenient blank piece of paper. So okay, so um, where's the pen? It's in between the computer and the uh, monitor. Computer and the monitor. Okay, thank you. Oh. Okay, so. Uh, the rotation, so we already uh, saw a little bit about where the, uh, so the self-shrinker equation, it turns out to be, uh, you know, these things, it's a variational problem. These things are minimal surfaces in the right, in the right metric. And the rotational case, the profile that describes the, ro the, uh, the rotational uh, 
surface is actually a geodesic in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the upper half plane. Okay, so that's what, how many, 10 minutes? Five minutes, 10 minutes? Okay, so, uh, so this turns out to be a second order ODE given by an equation that looks like u double prime is equal to x u prime over two uh, minus u over two plus one over u quantity times uh, one plus u prime squared, right? And uh, you can rewrite this guy so it actually becomes a, um, a uh, inhomogeneous second order ODE. And so what, the way we, we found these surfaces is by just getting an integral formula for graphs over, uh, for graphs. So this is the equation for graphs over the x-axis, I should say. And uh, so the idea is we just use freeze the co coefficients of the potential solution. And it turns out that the ho corresponding homogeneous equation, which I, you can write u double prime minus x over 2, 1 plus u prime squared uh, times uh, u prime uh, plus uh, 1 plus u prime squared times u is equal to 0. So uh, just by sort of inspecting this, if you, so there's a term that I left out. So the, the inhomogeneous equation has a term uh, 1 plus u prime squared. Is there a way to go back? Okay, so this pen has a button. So, okay, well, this isn't, a, isn't, a, isn't as much of a disaster as it looks like. So the point is, I just want to tell you is that so, so, the, you know, so basically, Cohen's are asymptotic solutions to, to, uh, to, the, to, to asymptotically solve shrinkers, right? So it turns out that if you just look at this uh, second order ODE and throw away the inhomogeneous term, uh, straight lines, which are co generate cones when you, uh, when you, as surface of revolution or exact solutions, right? So you can write down a, a, a particular exact solution to this equation, then just use some, you know, I was very happy that I took different ODE class when I was an undergrad, because it was just sort of a tour of that class to write down spanning solutions, then get a nice integral formula for any graph, which is on the next page here. So uh, just using some uh, variation parameters arguments, you get uh, an integral formula. It's a nice integral formula for any, uh, any solution, as long as it remains graphical. And then, as I said, you do a little dancing here, and just to show some terms go to zero the way you want them to when you take the parameter a to infinity in the upper integral here to get this nice sort of integral formula that uh, characterizes all graphs over the right half axis, axis right? So, so that was fun. That was, it was nice to see everything, how that worked out very miraculously there. And uh, so there's any, formula, any graph has to obey one of these solutions, it has to obey this integral formula, and then we just uh, show that this thing is actually a contraction map on a, on a very easy space of functions to get, the, that, that's, uh, to get a, a family of, uh, of solutions. So, uh, so uh, it just the, from uh, looking at, the, um, at this, uh, these equations here and just computing the derivative and what it's equal to, you immediately get this inequality that u prime x is less than u of x, which in the rotational case just means that these things have all, all have positive mean curvature as long as they're defined, as long as they're graphical. Right, and then just we know for a lot of reasons that these things do not remain embedded if you extend them beyond uh, the left side of the axis. So, uh, so uh, let's see here. So uh, I said I was gonna mention some, uh, some applications to gluing, but uh, I'm not gonna say anything. Let me just say that there's potential a applications to gluing construction for these guys. Um, so in particular, like, you know, so people are trying to do, do things with uh, desingularize the intersection of planes and cylinders, right? But it might be nice to try with these guys, see what we can get. Um, for, for various naive reasons, it seems much more sort of, uh, I'm sort of optimistic that it should work out. Uh, but again, they're for extremely naive reasons. Okay, so, and then the last thing we did, so the, the second theorem I did was, um, or we did is uh, to sort of characterize, partially characterize what embedded sort of geodesics look like in the upper half plane. And basically, so I didn't write anything down here because it's one of these very geometric arguments that's extremely simple. You know, you could explain, it's, it's basically a coloring book proof, but, you, based, uh, but sadly because of the sort of, uh, uh, the sort of conventions of paper writing, you have to write everything down in a, you know, mathematical notation. But so I figured I'd just draw the proof instead. So basically, um, the idea is, so we're in the XR plane here, right? And so we have a couple geodesics, so we have this is the line, so this is dimension two, so the r-axis here, and you have the line r is equal to square root two. 
And so if you have some sort of embedded geodesic, right, we're saying that in each quadrant it can only become non-graphical. So how much time do I have? All right, at most once. And if it becomes non-graphical at most once, then um, there it, it, at least once in each quadrant, then it has to generate a torus. So basically, the idea is you look at a part, two pieces of your geodesic where it comes vertical. And just doing some very simple sort of uh, analysis of the, from the equation, which I wrote down and quickly erased accidentally with this pen, you can see that, uh, first of all, these guys have to, in each quadrant, have to lie above and below the r-axis. Uh, or the, this line r equals uh, square root 2 here. <laughs> Not only that, but they, can't, they can never proceed monotonically down Okay, uh, they can never proceed monotonically from a vertical point to another vertical point. They have to always sort of have a minimum on the bottom there or a maximum. So you can excise this little bulb from your piece here, right? And then you're going to get another one of these guys, right? And uh, it may look something like this. And so uh, the point here is that it's just sort of more of an observation than a proof. The point is here now you just translate this guy to a uh, first point of contact and get a contradiction. So you can't, for any embedded guy, you can only have at most two vertical points in each, uh, in each quadrant. So, uh, and then it's easy to see that if, you, if it becomes vertical once in each quadrant, in the middle of the plane, it has to be a torus. And, uh, in, in a round, or a round sphere otherwise. So uh, I think, uh, so again, so the reason why we're doing this originally is we sort of wanted to find these nice sort of interesting surfaces to potentially glue together. We haven't done that yet, so hopefully I can uh, report back in a while. <laughs> so other than that, uh, how much time do I have? Four minutes. All right, I, I'm done actually, so if anybody has any questions.